Angel is brought to you by NetSuite from Oracle. The only system you need to run your business. Go to netsuite.com slash angel to get your free guide called Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast, Angel. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, an angel investor, an early stage investor here in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, as it's called. And I've invested in over 150 companies. And I started this podcast because there's a bit of a revolution going on. People have not been able to invest in technology startups because, candidly, they haven't been going public. They've stayed private longer and longer. Additionally, some regulation has passed here in the United States that allows even non-accredited investors to finally be able to dip their toe and invest small amounts of money in private companies. Now, this is a risky asset class. There, when you buy shares in these private companies, you don't have a ton of information. They're very young. They might be two or three people in them. And these are not liquid stocks. In other words, if you want to sell a share in a private company, you have to get the company's permission typically, and there's not a market for it. In other words, if you were trading Netflix or Amazon today on the stock market, you can buy and sell as you please. Private companies you're going to hold for seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years or more, and the majority of those companies go to zero. But in this crazy world of Silicon Valley, we frequently see companies and angel investors who have invested in them become worth a billion dollars or more. To give you some idea of this, I've invested in 150 companies. Six of them have become unicorns. That's a pretty good track record. Uh, you're not guaranteed that, but and it's also during a boom cycle here in Silicon Valley, so there's a tons of, tons of caveats there. But if you invest smartly, wisely, take your time, uh, and you learn, you can be part of the most exciting revolution happening on the planet today, which is entrepreneurs solving the world's biggest problems, whether it's Tesla or Uber or Airbnb or Google, Facebook before them. Uh, it's a pretty exciting place to be. I give this whole wind up and warm up because my first, my guest today, Jeff Clavier, was one of the first micro VCs. In fact, he kind of defined the category. There were only two people who had smaller funds that focused, it, focused on the earliest stage investments. They were Ron Conway and Jeff Clavier's uh, soft tech fund, which is now called Uncork Capital or on the yeah, encore capital. And uh, I guess also first round was in there too, in yes. terms of the people who do early. So welcome back to the program, Jeff Clavier. Thank you so much, Jason. Good to be here. Yeah, we uh, we know each other for over a decade. Over a decade, yeah. Yeah, and you- Almost 15 years, actually. Almost 15 years. How did you get started as an investor? Were you an entrepreneur who went into investing or were you always in finance? How did you, I, I, I don't I, actually know. I did a startup in the financial services market back in France, so I was mm. born in, um, in France, and we brought- You're French? Books. I was born French, yeah. I'm not oh, American. never would have guessed. No, keep going. I'm joking. I can, <laughs> I can do the podcast with a French accent if you prefer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and so um, we brought Sun workstations and trading floors in the late 80s. And this was actually really successful as a company uh, moved to the US and this eventually were acquired by Reuters. Mm. Uh, you know, it's either Reuters and Bloomberg in that space. So did that, uh, was a CTO, stayed for seven years, and then in 2000, moved to the Valley to become a traditional VC. Just then, in time for the market implosion. Uh, essentially, that's what got me here. Ah, uh, explain. The guys at the Reuters Greenhouse Fund, which was the corporate venture of Reuters, uh, invested the fund, their fund, from London, taking turns flying from London to San Francisco. And when the boom, you know, uh, the bust happened, essentially they needed an operator on the ground and they chose me because I was, I didn't have any idea whatsoever about the VC market, investing, whatever, but it was actually a very strong operator. So I came in and joined to essentially clean up the portfolio back in August of 2000. And at that time, everybody was running for the hills. It was absolute bloodshed everywhere. Companies imploding left, right and center, people losing their job. Uh, VCs counting their losses, huh. um, and a lot of traffic going to bankruptcy court in San Jose, where I spent way too much of my time. Yeah, explain why, when you look back on it, this actually happened. What was it that caused that massive implosion, and why did so many startups not be able to navigate through it? 
I think that at the time there was just this craziness where people were super excited about the potential of Web 1.0 and came up with a ton of unsustainable, you know, product services and 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 financials. And eventually everybody was sort of jumping on everything, financing them, not thinking about, hey, what does it mean to acquire a user or a customer or whatever? And because the bankers and the public markets were super ecstatic about this notion of a revolution in um, in the new sort of industry, they were just moving them to the public, uh, kind of to, to the public so they can actually trade and be accessible to uh, public market investors within 18 to 20 months, right? Of and the company so, forming. Of the company forming. So you were sort of forming the company, within six months you were raising your Series A, within 12 months you were raising your Series B, and you were already talking to the bankers about going public. And the problem is that none of those companies had any business. And I think mm. when I looked back, and what got me essentially to um, to start uh, Softech now in Quark, was this notion of, hey, if companies raise too much money ahead of having product market fit, then you can almost guarantee that it's going to be a disaster. And that's mm. what happened at that time. And is the reason that founders with too much money get distracted or you're just signaling that you're not a great founder because you're too focused on raising that much money? What is it that too much money causes? It, and it, it seems to be a universal experience when people raise too much money early they just never get product market fit. Yeah, you have to go through the pain of figuring out what is the right, you know, product functionality which is going to, you know, get you users and retain them. You have to figure out how to acquire users, which channels are actually the, the proper ones, and it has to be sort of painful and difficult and being scrappy often leads to greatness. And mm -hmm. so you want to make sure that you have enough capital to see through the different hurdles. And today this is true in the, in the seed market, see through the different hurdles for your next round. But if ever you have too much money, then you're just going to spend the money. And yeah. you know, it's very easy to spend $100 to get 10 or 20 or 70 cents back, which yeah. is unfortunately a lot of the new economics that we see today in companies that are struggling. Yeah, we saw this with Cosmo, Urban Fetch, those companies during the time who were doing delivery like yeah. Instacart is doing now, mm -hmm. where they were charging half price for the goods, free delivery at no minimums. Yeah. And we were trying to figure out, hey, how is this sustainable? So let's fast forward now, two decades later, here we are, and we see founders- Still looking good. You know, still looking good, hair. we're doing okay. So we still got a little gray, a little gray hair going here. but. We, we fast forward 20 years from that moment in time, and I see founders who have not built their products write a white paper and then raise 10 to $200 million in an ICO. Yes. Does this, I mean, in, in a way, what you outlined was six months to see a Series A, a year to B, and then two or three years to an IPO to raise 50 million. Now we see people doing that with a white paper only in the ICO space, and it's it seems to be those are a global group of crypto civilian investors putting their money into these. In mm -hmm. other words, retail investors. Uh, some funds. Some, some funds. funds. But when these ICOs, do you feel concern like you did in the dot-com era? Oh, I mean, this, this, <laughs> I'm going back, you know, 20 years almost, yeah. seeing exactly the same signs of, you know, people are just so excited about the potential that they don't think about the downside risk. And to be honest, because a lot of those retail investors have made their money right. on, you know, running Bitcoin and Ethereum portfolios and so on and so forth. And this run up has made them have the feeling that A, they are successful and they know what they're doing and B, it's almost sort of free money. So why not then invest in ICOs because it's just the next logical step. And I'm pretty sure there will be a couple of defining companies that do ICOs and do extremely well, but 98% will blow up and a bunch of them will be like, like this company we heard about, I don't remember the name, but basically there is an ICO, took the money and run, and the company has just disappeared. Yeah. So we'll have a lot of fraud and the SEC is starting to step in to try and, you know, see how they're going to regulate that. Yeah. And, and the rigor that you put into picking companies to invest in is a lot more than reading a white paper and then sending money to a wallet. Yes. Explain the difference between <laughs> your process and what's happening in the ICO space, which is a bunch of uninformed people get into a telegram room. I'm saying that, not you, but 
people who have no experience investing, generally speaking, outside of crypto, get into a a Telegram room and they just ship some mm -hmm. Ether or Bitcoin into a wallet and wait for coins to come back in two years. What do you do when you're assessing a company? What's your process? So the process, I mean, we could spend two hours on that, so I'm going to be short. Yeah. Um, first and foremost, you have to define your investment strategy. Um, either you can be like super broad and invest in anything that comes to you, assuming that you have a good inbound deal flow, or you're going to sort of figure out what are the sectors that you want to go after. And mm. so for us, it's SaaS B2B enterprise, bit of marketplaces B2B and B2C, um, bit of consumer, but all monetized. So we don't do the unmonetized consumer anymore. Uh, connected hardware, both consumer and industrial. And more recently in this most recent fund we raised, uh, Frontier Tech, which is mm -hmm. sort of a catch-all these days where it's AI, AR, VR, autonomous infrastructure, a uh, bit of space tech, robotics, and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. we basically say, we advertise, this is what we're interested in. We, we receive, you know, anywhere from 3,000, yeah, let's say 3,000 referrals per year, hmm. give or take, right? And eventually we'll close, call it 12 to 15 investments per year. Hmm. So we say no 99.5% of the time. If you look at the funnel, so 3,000 in, we say no right off the bat 70% of the time. It's not the right stage, not the right um, sector, uh, not the right geography, not the right, you know, company type opportunity and so on and so forth. So we just say no within 10 seconds. Then we spend a bit more time, we read about the founders, we read about the opportunity, the market and so on and so forth, ask for their deck, analyze it, and then we'll pass again on, you know, at least half of that. So we're gonna see maybe five to 600 entrepreneurs uh, in the office, uh, me and my two partners. One of us will take the first meeting. Then, you know, most of those companies will be passed on about 150 will get to the second and then third meeting, uh, 50 will go into due diligence, um, 18 will get offers, 15 will close. Uh, so you keep statistics on this, obviously, and you think about it with your partners of what is our funnel? What yes. is our process? Yes. And so the way you described it, 600 meetings, mm -hmm. which were called down. 600 the first meetings. First meetings, in-person meetings. Yes. Those were called down from thousands of pitches coming into your email box. Mm -hmm. So thousands to 600 meetings, those 600 meetings resulting in 15 investments. Yes. So you're looking at, uh, yeah, whatever that is. It's a five, it's basically a 5% from, yeah. from the meeting yeah. to the investments, 5% yeah. from the top of the funnel to Oof, the, much the investment is 0.5%. And when founders um, get a meeting, where they get two meetings or three meetings and then get a no, uh, this can be very disheartening for them. How do you manage that process of taking a lot of time uh, with the founders, but then passing? How do you do that gracefully? Uh, and I can't type, it's, uh, it's, I can't um, uh, compute, it's 2.5%. Um, you know, it's- Yeah, it's, two, um, two or 3%, yeah. yeah. Low single um, digits, yeah. So it's always tricky because the you try and sort of, A, give a quick no as quickly as possible, because right. you don't want to waste the entrepreneur's time, you want to be respectful. The problem is that the quick no is always sort of the easiest to give. But as you go down the funnel and, you know, you say, well, let's meet my other partner and then my third partner, and then let's do some reference checks and then do, you know, another meeting to go deeper in the technology, the product and so on and so forth. So you go from wasting one hour to sometimes 10 hours of the entrepreneur and then and then you feel really bad because at the end of the day you just couldn't get there mm. and you try and explain why you passed and you try and be useful helpful and say well this is what i learned this is why i'm passing and right. you're sort of half apologetic but at the same time it is what it's about when you feel yeah. raised so it's it's being as decisive as possible and trying to avoid like taking time because you can because mm. sometimes uh, VCs will spend, always spin an entrepreneur for a couple of months before passing. So we try and get all those processes uh, to be run over, you know, a couple of weeks. But sometimes we can't. Sometimes mm. we're talking about like new sectors. Uh, space tech is a good example where if you invest in something brand new, you have to learn about the space. You have to meet with people who have done it before, get, you know, sort of experts involved. And by definition, those, you know, a process like that will take three to four weeks. 
Um, and there's no way to do it faster unless you just invest sight and scene. Some people do that. Really? They just say, oh, yeah. I'll just make a small bet here. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, we do see that in angel investing. Somebody knows somebody, mm -hmm. so they invest in somebody they know. That seems legitimate. Which is, which is fine. You know, everybody but, has their own. As long as you define your strategy and you stick to it, yeah. almost any strategy is valid. It's right. more the randomness that is dangerous. People would criticize hundreds of investments as spray and pray. People criticized, I guess, Ron Conway about that. Not so much you, but maybe 500 startups when you get mm -hmm. to those big numbers. Um, but even in the spray and pray, those, I believe uh, those funds turned out to be ahead. I'm not sure what will happen with 500 startups, but I know with Ron Conway, he wound up being ahead, I guess, hitting Google and having a tiny sliver of Facebook. Because because Ron was was able to build sort of an index fund with the right companies in the index. Right. right? And so what, what Ron had is unique access, which mm. means that all the best entrepreneurs and companies would, would give him an allocation. And, mm. you know, there was a say, there is always sort of room for Ron Conway. So as right. long as he chose that a company was worthy of his cash, he could actually get it in. It's not something that is available to everyone. So Explain that dynamic here, because this sounds to people who are just getting into angel investing or maybe are outside the industry, um, they may not understand. Why is it that access to the top deals was so important? Because at the end of the day, if you look at the distribution of successes in the um, in the industry, i.e., which companies will actually return so much of a fund's performance that they are the only ones that matter, um, in a typical fund, let's say 40, 40 investments we make per um, per fund, only four or five companies will really matter because they will return the fund, two x the fund, or more. Um, and when you sort of look at that distribution of performance, the rest is not really sort of impacting your, your performance at all. And therefore, if you, if you compound that with the fact that about 15 to 20 companies really sort of matter per year in terms of creation, you know, uh, sort of growth and eventually exits, if you can tap into one or two of those per fund cohort, then you will be very successful. And that's what Ron has been doing for a bunch of years, is figure out you know, which companies, which founders will be really good. And the challenge is have enough of those winners. And so this spray and pray strategy that you mentioned, which is, hey, you know, here is 10, 100, 1,000 checks of, of $100,000, can be very profitable per investment, but if you have a $100 million fund, you may not return much of the fund with that mm. small check. So we have a different strategy. We'll do 40 investments per fund, but we'll get anywhere from 7 to 10% of a company mm. when we write that check, which means that a billion dollar outcome will return the fund. Right. And you have to think about returning the fund as a fund manager because you don't get paid anything except for the management fees until, which are in advance, until you clear whatever the total amount of the fund is. Yes. If you have a $200 million fund and you get to 199 million, you get nothing. You get nothing. Zero. And you don't and you don't raise another fund most likely because your LPs yeah. are not happy with you. All right, when we get back from this quick break, I have a question to ask you as a new fund manager. I just finished my first launch fund one, awesome. which was a $10 million deployment. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I wanna know what after launch after your first fund, now that you're on your fifth, what you learned in that two, three, four fund that you wish you had known back when you were getting started? You know, what do you know now in funds four and five that you didn't know in one, two, and three when we get back on Angel? Hey, everybody, let me take a moment to thank my friends at NetSuite by Oracle. Yes, the results are in, and Survey Inc.'s 5,000 company survey shows that the top barriers to growth are. Finance takes too long to close the books. That's number one. Number two, your company is too slow to launch new products. Number three, hiring and keeping good people. Number four, managing cash. And number five, too many disparate, disconnected systems. So it's a hard for founders and management teams to get a full picture of their business. It sounds like all of these companies are outgrowing their business and financial management systems, doesn't it? Well, QuickBooks and spreadsheets, they can only get you so far. They're great at the start, but it's now taking you two or three times as much effort to get this basic reporting. And you cannot get accurate answers to your questions as a management team. Does this sound familiar? It does to me. 
and that makes it impossible for you to make strategy decisions going forward. You should know that the number one system for growing your company is NetSuite from Oracle. Yes, that's right. NetSuite from Oracle is the one system, the one singular system that will track and manage revenue, cash flow, HR, in inventory, and even your projects, even e-commerce for every single industry. That's why NetSuite is so powerful. You can run your business from a dashboard even on your phone. And you need that dashboard so you can make those critical decisions as the business leader. It's not it's never too early to invest in NetSuite and to start using the professional grade business management systems uh, that they provide. So go to netsuite.com slash angel, netsuite.com slash angel and get your free guide called Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth. That's netsuite.com slash angel, netsuite.com slash angel. It's the only system, the only system that you need to run your business. Get that free guide, Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth at netsuite.com slash angel thanks again to netsuite for supporting season two of angel okay let's get back to this amazing discussion hey everybody welcome back to angel the podcast you can visit us angelpodcast.com and you can find us in itunes write a review hey rate us that always helps and spread the word email your friends tell them angel podcast if uh their founders or their high net worth individuals looking to invest in the riskiest asset class on the planet or i should say now the second riskiest. The second most riskiest now we're yeah, the second exactly. riskiest we used to FRSCOs. be the, yeah we used to feel like we were the ones doing the dangerous work now people a white paper jeff can we just I, let that soak in for a second you and i could sit here and write a white paper with our pedigrees which are long mm -hmm. 350 combined investments multiple unicorns between us we could write a white paper this weekend Get a couple of bottles of wine, a little brie, huh? Mm -hmm. I have a feeling, you know, where we can get some uh, good French bread. We sit there, we drink a little wine, we have a little brie, we write a white paper. Bing, bang, boom, $200 million in Ethereum in our bank accounts. That's all? That's Damn. it. I would I would say more, but okay. Yeah, but sure. anyway, take the $200 million Ethereum, we chop it up, and uh, yeah, that's it. Have you thought about doing an ICO or a coin or a cryptocurrency to back the fund, in all seriousness, in order to allow liquidity for the LPs. And do L would LPs even care about that? Because we saw, I guess, Brock Pierce made a small $10 million fund or something, maybe it's a $40 million fund, for an investment fund that is crypto backed. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's gonna be a thing? And have you thought about it? You must've thought about it. Have you considered it, I guess would be the better question. So we, that's actually touching on one thing, which is, interesting with cryptocurrencies and, and things which are doing SEOs is the fact that you can actually commit early, get sort of the potential risk um, kind of curve where if it's super early, it's cheaper. And as the company sort of proves, it, proves itself, then it becomes um, a bit more expensive and you can start getting liquidity in the middle. That's the only characteristic which is so interesting to me because obviously as you said in your introduction it takes a long long time for funds like ours seed funds to mature like a great seed fund will start will have returned its capital you know after year six seven eight right mm. depending on the maturity of the companies and when they actually exit which means that lps are stuck mm. for years and years uh, you know my first fund fund one took 13 years to get wow. out of the entire portfolio right 24 companies the last one sold in 2017 so lps would love to get early liquidity if they could and the problem is that when you invest in seed as an lp it's not possible so mm -hmm. that's intriguing however i think that today you have uh, because the market is very efficient you have secondary uh, shops that buy the position of, of the LPs mm. and can actually get appreciation on a fund like yours or mine right. mid-flight. And so there are alternative, more traditional uh, mechanisms than, than ICOs. Um, when I just talked to uh, my lawyer, uh, Steve Franklin at uh, Gunderson, and Steve is one of the most experienced fund formation lawyers in Silicon Valley, and I said, so ICOs, tokens, you know, partial liquidity it just stared at me like the you want to go to jail kind of stare yeah so um, i think it's a bit too early to figure out that mm -hmm. but i think the intermediate liquidity is something that i would look at but the whole notion of um not getting professional investors institutional investors as backers terrifies me yeah see it's interesting i i was in the terrified camp 
And then after doing an AngelList syndicate for so long, and now it's on Jason syndicate, we moved off AngelList mm -hmm. uh, to run it independently. And we have 2,000 members. And now that it's got 2,000 members and it fills up a syndicate very quickly, we you know we do two or three hundred k per mm -hmm. hour of, to in an investment. So 99 slots, it's only on average two k per person, three k yep. per person. And people are doing it to learn. And I'm obviously investing, so they, that should be some sort of signal for people, not the ultimate signal, but a mm -hmm. signal. Um, and I've started to think, gosh, you know, if you could have all 2,000 people put $100 in each, and those 2,000 people were civilians, our, our siblings and cousins and uncles and aunts, and they got to get in early on some of the companies we have, that would be fun and educational for them. True. Right? And so as long as the dollar amounts were contained and, and you weren't, and you had a fund manager watching it, I would feel almost okay with civilians doing it. I, I wish we had the fluidity in which we could say, you know, civilians can invest in startups with a fund manager, you know, like ourselves saying, okay, I'll make sure the paperwork gets done. I'll make sure that mm -hmm. the founder does monthly updates I'll, or try, <laughs> not always succeed, but tr beg the founder for yeah. updates. <laughs> How, how do you how do you manage the update situation? Because it, it's changed over time. In the early days, you didn't even ask them. You have to. Well, we try. <clears throat> so we meet uh, with our founders regularly. We remind them that they have to send at least a quarterly update to all the investors. We offer them tools. Uh, like we, we've partnered with a company which makes it super easy to send, you know, updates and give what you sort of the graph. Visible. Visible, I've heard Visible. of it, yeah. And so it's a reporting framework which is uh, really interesting. Um, you know, we've, we we mandated that our companies sort of use Carta and Carta is developing a solution. So, you know, we there's so much In you Carta? can... Carta, it's the Carta. old e-shares. Oh, the so e-shares, e yeah, they change it to Carta. It's not called, yeah, Carta. Oh, you mandate that they use it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's, not, it's, in the, it's in the term sheet. Yeah. So they have to uh, use Carta because it makes our life, you know, them, theirs, and ours much easier. And so it's good What is them. Carta, formerly e-shares, what, what's the killer feature for you? The cap table? It's the cap table management, the fact that they have a, an overall so reporting of your portfolio so you can see you know, everything to the fund level. You can then give access to your LPs. So all of our communication to LPs now is done through Carta. Uh, and, you know, we have um, anywhere from 40 to 60 limited partners per fund. Most of them are institutional, but we do have individuals. Um, our, all our funds are QP only, uh, qualified purchaser. Mm. So, because, you know, there are limits for the types of funds that we invest in mm. uh, in terms of v, the, the vehicles have to have accredited investors so you know i think at, eventually they will what you describe will be possible but i you know given the state of the market i will i feel way way more com comfortable working with you know uh, limited partners who will be there for many funds mm. as long as we perform uh, let's talk a little bit about um, how you um, how you learn a vertical because this is one of the most interesting things I think is since you've lasted so long and I want to get back to my question about the portfolios <laughs> but because that's in my own best interest but I, I think the people listening probably were like this is sounds like the greatest job ever yes he's it interest is. it is isn't it right <laughs> why is it the best job ever in your mind oh because you have the luck I mean it, you're so lucky to see the world through the eyes of sometimes really crazy entrepreneurs who will describe a future that is informed by their vision and you will sort of um and um and ask yourself and then eventually every now and then you will back them and yes you know it will work and mm. when you sort of look back at some of those great investments that that turn into a massive exit or an ipo and there is always sort of this magic around the ipo mm. um it's just like mind blowing yeah, a special feeling that, you know, you you were there, you supported, you helped. There's always one of two things that an investor has done to just shape the trajectory and the destiny of a startup. Right. And when you can just say, well, I did this and that, you know, enabled that awesome company and those, this awesome story, I think it's it's not so much the pride, it's just like this this achievement you've you've enabled for a team and you know right. I, I had a, i was lucky enough to uh, to be an early investor in sandgrid so we we did the sandgrid ipo um, oh my god a few that's weeks ago. huge congratulations and, yes and they brought you know uh pretty much all the 
employees who had been there for five years. So it was actually a, a pretty big group and it was so awesome to be in the middle of the pit, you know, rejoicing with them when the, uh, the first trade happened. And people don't know this, but no Y Combinator company has ever gone public. No. Not one. It's the first IPO of, of uh, all the accelerators. All Tech the stars. accelerators has only been one, SendGrid. And SendGrid has a market cap of what? Two uh, billion, three billion, I don't no, know. No, no, it's, like it's a, a bit less than a billion. Okay, so, so if it was at a billion and the incubator got 6%, uh, they got diluted a little bit, it's a $40 million position. If you think about the Techstars incubators, $40 million position, and they're making $100,000 bets. It, I don't even know whether it was that big at It might have been $50,000 bets at this, that time. This was- 25,000. Yeah, this, this was like in yeah. the very early days. It's probably 25,000. Um, it was a 2009 investment yeah. cycle. So, but if you think about it, if the, even today at $100,000 investments, that one investment returns, even with the dilution, if it was $40 million, it, I don't know, my math's not perfect here, but I think that that's like 400 mm -hmm. companies getting 100,000 each, yeah. right? Four would be 400,000 and- uh, yeah, yeah, 10 would be 4 million and 100 would be yeah. Yeah. 400. It's unbelievable. 400 startups could be funded just from that one. Mm -hmm. So they only have to hit one in 400 for it to work out. When you invest super early, and, and that's really sort of the, the genius of, you know, Paul Graham and the other accelerators is to be able to get into those companies at the sub, like million dollar evaluation yeah. and make all those bets. And then, you know, over a batch of, 20 or or now 200 at YC, yeah. only 10% of those companies will matter. But yeah. then the, the leverage they will get on those dollars is just insane. And in fairness to YC, they have Airbnb and Dropbox, yeah. which combined will, you know, be 50. 50 ish billion. Yeah. yeah. I mean, 10 billion 40. for Dropbox and 30 for Airbnb, 30, 40, 50. Yeah. You know, who knows what the market will be at. And there's a bunch of others, you know, they have Stripe as well. I mean, the Stripe's 10, for sure 10, right? Yeah. They are, uh, yeah, nine, ten, um, yeah. and then and then some. So yeah, yeah, and they've had other exits along the way. So I I don't, I don't mean that to beat them up, but it, it does say something about how hard it is to IPO that this is literally the first one, and Dropbox is now ten years old because they were at the first TechCrunch forty mm -hmm. conference we did. Um, what how? How do you learn a new vertical? Because that seems to me to be one of the great upsides of the job. You talked about being part of something and just the incredible uh, warm feeling you get when you know that you helped make something that changed the world. Mm -hmm. But this other thing seems super exciting to me too. Like, I know nothing about space. Let me go talk to 20 founders in the space, space. <laughs> and, you know, like in the space vertical, this is incredible. Yeah, How, but that's busy. This is, I mean. That's the whole strategy. It's that simple, right? Just sit there and not understand and have them explain to you. It's, it's sort of that. So first and foremost, you have to understand as an investor, what you're comfortable with and what you're not. And mm -hmm. I think after doing this for, you know, 17 years and having done 200 investments, um, I sort of have a good feel as to what I know I can be comfortable with. Like I, I know what my risk threshold is and mm -hmm. it's very important to um, to understand it. And so, you know, I was very intrigued by, you know, space. Um, and I saw some of my friends uh, bet on the, a few early uh, satellite companies, a few, uh, you know, rocket companies. Um, and I was like, hmm, this is, this is intriguing. And I would not do this because um, I had, I was exploring other, other types of, um, of new sectors. And then suddenly uh, it sort of became a bug and I wanted to um, learn. And so I just reached out to people who were investing in space, to founders who were uh, doing space deals, uh, took to a few angels who were doing space. And I said, hey, I'll take a look. And, yeah. you know, we always have sort of a bar to the first meeting. Yeah. Then you drop the bar to low, like almost no bar, no hurdle. Just right. take any meeting from anyone who's doing a space a right. space tech startup. And so you just learn about space and the opportunities and you figure out, oh, okay, there is the satellites and the satellite launchers and the, you know, rockets and the, equip the equipment and the 3D printed um um, engines and you know the infrastructure and and the communication and so you look at the space ecosystem and try and meet I, don't know, I think I've seen 30 20 or 30 different you know opportunities and I scratched all of them because mm. I was like no way no, no not interesting now and finally one day 
I was referred to uh, this company, Loft Orbital, which we ended up uh, backing. And that was a really interesting concept of bringing the, this notion of shared resources to space. So today, if you're launching a satellite, it's basically your satellite, you put you know, your sensors, and you have to figure out your mission. So you know, who's going to build it, who's going to launch it, who's going to manage it, and so on and so forth. And then there's a, you know, uh, there's a life to a, a satellite. They don't stay up, you know, forever. Mm -hmm. So the small nano satellites will stay for a year. Uh, those sort of average size satellites that um, they call them low Earth orbit satellites, yeah. right? Low Earth um, orbit. And those those guys will launch satellites which last for about five years. And so what Love does is they say, well, we just need to use the resources of the satellite on top of the region that we want to monitor for, you know, whatever purpose, and then change the sensor, you know, give power and data access and so on and so forth to another sensor as we rotate around the Earth. And so we can actually run in parallel four to seven missions. Hmm. So you put all Time the sharing sensor, a satellite. You time share a satellite and you just build right. your operating system. And that switches the software, you, yeah. To you, the satellite actually appears to be a data stream and an API. So you completely abstract the complexity wow. of, you know, sending something in, in uh, Satellite in as a service. Satellite as a service. Wait, payload as a service. Payload as a service, right. And so that's what those guys do. Um, then you sort of look at their track record. Antoine uh, is French. Don't hold that against him. Um, mm -hmm has spent uh, a lot of time in his career at uh, Airbus um, and Ionespace and in the space industry. His co-founder has is a specialist, is a you know, product engineer in space. And those guys have just been doing space for an aggregate of whatever, 40 years. So product, uh, sorry, founder market fit was just up the wazoo. And funny enough, but you remind, it reminded me of SendGrid. Because what is SendGrid? SendGrid is a piece of infrastructure for the e-commerce market and, and now sort of broad internet. And essentially what um, Love Torbital does is they build that software layer that just hides the complexity and eventually can literally take the cost of a mission of, you know, call it $30 million down to 506. Mm. And so amazing. on paper, it's amazing. Obviously, it's going to be hard as hell mm. but i was actually comfortable with the software nature because they're not building the satellite not building the launcher so they're working with you know some partners for satellites some launchers and you know if all goes well first satellite launch will be a couple of years uh let's talk about my question that i teased before the break which was what have you learned uh over these first couple of funds that if you go back in time you would change about the early funds what what have you learned and that you now take with you into this fifth fund so I think what's interesting, Jason, is um, Fund 2, the fund I launched at TechCrunch 40 with you on stage yeah. on September 18th of 2007, and that day you said, where the hell would anyone sort of do a small fund? Yeah. Um, it was a demo fund. I didn't really have a super strict portfolio construction strategy. I was doing like, hey, you know, if I like the deal, I'll do 100K. If I love the deal, I'll do 250K. Eh, reserve, we'll see. Um, don't really care about levels of ownership and so on and so forth. And it was good because it was a small fund and it could be very flexible and, and iterate over time. It was my, you know, my MVP. Fund right. two was my MVP, right? But now it's all about being very clear in terms of how much we invest, what is the percentage of ownership, what we do, what we don't do. And, you know, this sort of clear um, strategy and, the, I mean, Really, uh, and we've evolved it over time. Has really sort of made crispy clear for LPs as to why they want to work with us. Yeah. The one thing which I learned the the most, I would say, is always be raising. Mm. I was very trans. I mean, I mean, I was on my own. Remember, I, yeah. I, I just did like an eighty nine investment on my own before I right. brought you know some partners and some staff. Um, so there was a lot of work to do, which means that I was very transactional in the way I was interacting with LPs. Um, so. I wouldn't take meetings, wouldn't talk to them until I was in fundraising mode and then I was saying, hey, invest in me. That's not how limited partners um, want to interact with you. They want to get to know you over time. When you raise a fund, you're going to be raising fund two and you have to just be prepared to meet limited partners for fund three and fund four because they will look at you in fund two and they will pass. They may look at you in fund three and they will pass, but they may be there for you in fund four. And I remember meeting this... Um, 
this limited partner who said, I will not invest in you before Fund 5. Fund 5 is sort of this magical number, it feels mm -hmm. like, where suddenly it becomes easy because you're a bit more proven, maybe, I don't know. But um, he said, I won't touch you before Fund 5, but I'll be there for Fund 5. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have room for him in Fund 5. But, you know, it's wait, the whole wait, point wait, I've wait, got. Wait, wait, wait. You didn't have room for him or you made a point of not having room for him? I'll take the fifth on that one. Exactly. Um, See, very interesting you're saying this because... Um, you know, we're not allowed to talk about if we're raising funds currently. No. So I'll just say, if I was. If you were. If I was, and if I was, ex I, if a friend of mine had a similar experience, it would be exactly what you're describing, <laughs> which is people meeting with the big endowments or people who have large, large funds of funds. And these LPs would say stuff to my friend like, oh my God, this is amazing. Your track record is unbelievable. And we absolutely cannot wait to be in business with you on your next fund. So we really want you to save us a piece in the next fund. And I, I would look at them and I'd like, can I ask you a question? If you believe it's amazing and my track record is amazing, why not just put it in a small bet now? And then you would be guaranteed space in the next fund. What happens if there's no room in there? Like, yeah, that's a big risk. So we want to make sure we meet with you twice next year and check in on everything so we can definitely be in that next fund. And I was just thinking to myself, if I actually get the room, I am going to make a point of not having room for you. Like, isn't the whole idea to support people early? Well, I guess you got to get to know our, people. In our, yeah. in our world, yeah. yes. LPs just think about opportunities differently and yeah. you know they don't they don't really sort of have this have this anti-portfolio concept mm -hmm. where, where it's like well I passed on Uber and you know you showed it to me and I passed on Airbnb because you know whatever whatever like they will not say oh you know I just passed on Softech or on launch you know three times or whatever and then they wouldn't give me a piece of the action it's just not the way they, um, they look yeah. at things um, right. so you have to just respect this notion that um, they are very patient and if if they give you a fund mm. to give you two or three funds. Right. So the decision that they make to be in business with you is going to be a decade last. long. Yes, exactly. It's a decade. Like yeah, that makes sense so, to me. So that's why you, you got to be patient with them, I guess. You just have to respect that. And I think going back ten years, you know, when when you and I were on stage, and I was absolutely clueless about this whole world of fundraising, because you know, f raising fund two was just a piece of cake. It yeah. just happened over the summer of two thousand seven. No one knew what we were doing anyway, but it was like. That, that was this transition of the 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 super angels to micro VCs that happened at that time. Right. And people were just fascinated by our deal flow, mm. our early track record, and said, gee, it would, for the longest time we were ignored, but then we just backed awesome companies after awesome companies. And then they wanted to um, to work with us. And one way for them to work with us was support us through those early funds and so that's what happened literally eight weeks boom done and it doesn't happen like that in real life and, and truthfully it took me two years to raise my next fund um but you really need to understand the cycles and the portfolio construction and and so on and so forth that they go through because as one of their fund investment you're in a given box right you're like early stage tech U.S., you know, blah, mm. blah, blah, blah. And you have to be very precise. You have to be, especially in this environment where you have 570 uh, pre-seed, seed, and post-seed funds, you have to have a shtick, which is, this is why I'm, you know, the best for this particular category that, and founders who are interested in working with someone who can help them there will come to me. Um, those LPs will want to understand why you're the best you know, uh, investor for this particular category. And you have to demonstrate through your track record that you have A, um, the track record, but also the replicability. Because mm. people will say, oh, you've been awesome, but you know, you may have been lucky. Mm. And yeah. it takes a while for people to see I think this that's sort what of I, consistency. I, I think my friend is having a little bit of that exact experience where people are like, because my friend hit one of those decacorns you mentioned, mm -hmm. and uh, they might be like, hmm, I wonder if that kid got lucky and now he's, or if it's skill, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, fascinating. Let's go through your portfolio a bit. Mm -hmm. You did Fitbit. Amazing. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm wearing one now. How did you find that company? And uh, and that was a hard bet to make, I think, at the time, because it was hardware. And hardware right. 10 years ago was 
correct me if I'm wrong, really hard. Oh, the, and, and it's hard now, it but still, it was still absurdly ab hard. It was absurdly hard. And so, so Fitbit, I met in 2008. And so that was four years after starting uh, Softec non Cork. And at that time, I had this nagging question, which was, hmm, capital efficiency has allowed us to build awesome companies, you know, relatively cheaply compared to, um, you know, the 96 to 99 cohorts, I wonder whether hardware is the same. Like, mm. would capital efficiency apply to hardware? Right. And I had that question, right? And what then, was the answer? <laughs> and then... Uh, we'll get to it. <laughs> we'll get to it. And then a few months later, um, a friend of mine sort of writes me and says, hey, you know, there, those two guys, pretty awesome entrepreneurs building a connected podometer, it's called Fitbit, want to meet them. And as, as you said, there were barely one or two hardware investments coming to you per year at right. that time. So I was like, sure. And so I met uh, James and Eric uh, in Palo Alto. Uh, I think it was uh, June, July, 2000, uh, June 2008. And they pitched me on the concept of, you know, the potometer that is connected gives you, you know, transfers information and gives you sort of visibility and everything, wellness focused. And it was like, okay, so potometer you can buy at Walgreens for 15 bucks and this is going to be $100 and it was ugly as crap, you know, because it was an ugly prototype like every uh, hardware startup that you meet. But I was really intrigued because James and Eric are really, really smart. But I was like, would anyone sort of buy that? Like literally, why? Um, so I was I was not convinced. So, you know, um, I think I may have met them a second time, I'm not even sure. But um, then, you know, go on vacation, come back, um, take on 50, and here's Fitbit on stage. And they show like a, a nice rendition of the product. They have a really polished, pitch and i can see and i see uh my friends or our friends ev williams yeah. and kevin rose you know as judges and they're literally salivating yeah like they want it they want yeah. they want to lick it they want to use it they want it and i'm like <laughs> i'll take that as a market proof right and i run after james you know um and we sat on the side you know there were like these these meeting tables yeah. on the side right yeah so um, was there and I basically said, so where's my investment? He's like, which investment? He's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to invest in Fitbit. Yeah. You didn't get my email. I never sent that email. Um, and he's like, well, you know, we're almost closed or whatever, but, you know, we'll make some room for you. And so I just caught the opportunity at the right time. Yeah. And, and sometimes you have to go with your gut, right? You get a gut sense that these are the people, this is the time, it's the moment, it's the product. And you use, you know, Ev and, and Kevin salivating as a proxy to uh, market, you yeah. know, uh, pool. And because it was late in the process, my, my, my dear friend John Callahan was the, um, from True Ventures was the, the lead. There was just a, a small $125,000 uh, available. And, you know, I get in and say, how can I help? Oh, well, you know, we're launching for Christmas and, and you can help with that. So start getting involved. And, and this is when it hits, which is hardware is so freaking hard. Yeah. And the problem is that I, as an investor, had no clue because that was my first hardware deal. And the problem is that James and Eric had no clue either because it was their first hardware yeah. startup. And, you know, as I always joke, they promised to deliver, you know, the first uh, batch of Fitbits for Christmas. Thank God they didn't say which one. Hmm. And so they were supposed, they thought, to yeah. release the first Fitbit Christmas 2008 and to continue Christmas 2009. It always to, takes um, longer to build. And it always costs twice as much as they think, or three times. Or oh, three times. And yeah. remember that they actually achieved what they said they would do. So it's very rare no, you know, yeah. amongst hardware startups that they actually sort of deliver right. the product that does exactly what they promised. And a product that makes people happy. I mean, if you look, even like Ring, which is a very successful product now, the, the first version of that that James did, Door something, I can't remember, Doorbot, I maybe it was called. Mm -hmm. I mean, it got terrible rules. It got savage because yes. it was just when you add, Software is hard enough. You had hardware to software, and now you got two different things you've got to get right. Let's talk a little bit about Chartbeat as well. And so, yeah, the answer is no. It's not capital efficient. At it's all. not capital efficient at all. No, it's uh, hard. It's hard, and you know, there, I think there was this mirage, a collective mirage around uh, Indiegogo and Kickstarter mm -hmm. because we'd see Oculus. 
uh, Pebble, and other projects just do extraordinary. And so you'd have consumer demand mm -hmm. would give you this false sense of, okay, we can, we can do this. We've already eliminated consumer demand. We know there's consumer demand for this because people are paying in advance. Yep. And then what I realized was almost universally, I would meet startups and say, how much are you raising your Kickstarter? Well, we raised $300,000. Okay, what's it gonna cost you to deliver the product? He's like, well, you know, we charge $200 for the early bird and the building materials will probably be 250 and then we gotta do marketing. So it probably costs about $500. I'm like, so the Kickstarter people are paying $300 less per unit mm -hmm. than it costs you to build them. Like, what do we think is gonna happen here? Like- That's called digging your own grave. Yeah. I mean, literally you're like, but the plane's going faster, so this must be good. It's like, no, the plane is pointing towards the earth. Yeah. It's going faster because of gravity. You're going to crash into the ground. We need to go up. Which is why, unfortunately, so many hardware startups had a hard time sort of scaling. And like, you know, if you if you actually think about very successful outcomes, obviously you have Nest, you have Fitbit, uh, you have Dropcam. Dropcam. And, you know, so recently uh, sold um, August, to a sabloy. So there, there's been, you know, sort of good outcomes to great outcomes, but they're just like, you know, you don't even Oculus have- Oculus like, would be a good one. Oculus was a good one, obviously. Yeah. So we have three great ones. Yeah. Good. To, we have three great ones. Three great ones. Uh, and then a and bunch a, of singles and doubles. Yeah. Maybe you got your money back, maybe you triple your money, who mm -hmm. knows? But, but not home runs, not 100X, not, yeah. not 50X. It's hard to get a home run. And even Jawbone, which was supposed to be the big one- Just God, blew up 900 just, million and went nowhere. It went nowhere and they had done so good in the early days, but it seems like they got too many products concurrently. And then you just think about Apple, Microsoft and Google and Samsung and how quickly they can copy a startup. Mm -hmm. how, talk about how much things have changed in the last 10 years with the fact that the big technology companies are no longer dumb and slow. I think it's it's really a matter of figuring out which of the ponds you're going to try and fish into, and which are the ones that you you will avoid at at all costs. Um, what's what's been interesting with Microsoft, uh, uh, you know, I was a partner of Microsoft in the very early days uh, at my startup, and they had this uh, roadmap that said, okay, here is the green, here is the um, yellow, here is the red, and they were basically telling you what they're going to invest in, and therefore you should you should stay the hell away what is potentially risky and what's, you know, open field. And we used that to sort of figure out what we would sort of develop in those, um, in, in those kinds of uh, sectors. I think that now they try and, and do that as well. Um, you know, Google will tell you what they, sort of what they plan to do with uh, the Google Cloud. Amazon will sort of keep everything to the vest, uh, but <clears throat> close to the vest, but you know they're really expanding Amazon Web Services. So you're trying to figure out what is sort of the unique um, functionality? What is the unique technology? What is the unique insight that I have that I can go deep into? And even one of those big guys comes in, it's actually okay. Look, SendGrid is not the only company sending emails. No, They're Amazon has a competitor product now. Which it's is just cheaper. Not, which it's is cheaper, but it's, but it's nowhere not, near as good. Yeah. We looked at, we compared <clears> Amazon's <throat> email service to SendGrid's and we use SendGrid's at Inside. It's 50 times better. I mean, they're so focused. They have so many more features and API hooks that you can't even get somebody from Amazon Web Services on the phone to talk about the email product. It's just like a very generic version of it. It's sort of like buying, like, I'm trying to think of the most. That's kind of a generic, okay kind of yeah. product. But the point is, it's it's about the experience, not only, you know, the technology, it's about the experience. And so what you need to figure out today, like a good, uh, what's interesting is look at Facebook and how they have expanded the, oh, you know, the products that and they copied are, Snapchat so fervently. But also, you know, they have Marketplace. They have like all those sort of different products. And guess what? They have 2 billion users that they can throw their product at and suddenly there's a button that appears and guess what? Everybody <laughs> uses them. Everybody has eBay. <laughs> so it's really sort of challenging, especially in the consumer space, to figure out what are the open fields. Um, and, you know, we, we give it a shot based on the unique insight of the founders. And, you know, what's, what's tricky, because when you and I started, we couldn't lose. Remember those days when, you know, yeah. if all went well, we had a great outcome. And if ever like someone didn't really work out, we could sort of just sell the company back for like 
money back or like two or three. Sometimes I would do three X on the, yeah. on a failed company. Yeah. Those days are gone. You basically you go to zero. Like it's going to zero, and so it's way more risky, and that's why you have to be way more thoughtful about which sectors, the landscape, because yeah, the the big companies aren't them anymore. Uh, you can't There's, assume that you can, you know. Is that because there's so many companies them. now that the M&A departments at these companies could never absorb the startups yeah. that are dying? It's just too many. Yeah. There's way too many. And they've learned their lessons as well because they've sort of seen what it meant for them to acquire this company for 25 million and basically within you know six months everybody's gone and they haven't done anything with the technology it was a waste of time and resources yeah so it's not even the money for them it's really the time and resources yeah. to try to integrate it and close the deal so now they're pretty they're pretty clear it's like okay i'll give you the press release and that's the only thing that you'll see as an investor interested yeah and therefore what do you, you do in that situation oh we we basically tell because we used to ask employees and founders to stick around yeah. right for two three years with the acquirer because we we're returning the cash or getting you know some hmm. some you know performance or or uh profits but now if i get 10 cents on the dollar so i invest a million i get hundred thousand dollar back yeah and i'm gonna ask them to spend three years of their life with the acquirer for that yeah no way yeah no way. so you say don't sell it and just start a new company we'll invest in the next one yeah yeah, yeah i've had the situation come up a bunch of times where, you know, a bunch of times, a handful of times, you know, three or four times, where big companies want to buy something and they give zero consideration to the investors. Yeah, they were really like, kept yeah. I'm like, why would I sign off on this? And you want me to sign, you know, indemnifications and non-disclosures. There's no reason for me to sign. I'm getting nothing. Yeah. And for me to sign, I shouldn't I get something? Like 10 cents on the dollar? Would that be too much to ask? It doesn't make much sense to me. But as a uh, as an as an angel whatever you get back is is sort of meaningful as a fund manager like whether you get zero or ten cents is the same in the grand scheme of things right so you're going for the you carry sort of, you, well you think about the overall performance and you know what what the deal is and it, it just doesn't make any sense now that i have a, finished my first fund i actually look at the losses and i'm like i know that's going to lose mm -hmm. it's better we just get it off the books now wrap up the story and move on and focus on the other one. So it's almost like if I have 10 that I'm lost faith in and I've got three or four winners, it's like the sooner those 10 can wrap it up and move on to their yeah. next startup, the better it is for everybody. The better it is for you because you can focus, because you know at the end of the day, we should spend all of our time on our winners, but in reality, we don't. We And, and we at Uncork, really want to make sure that everyone gets the support and the help and you know soft landing a company it takes a long time Ugh. you know trying to work out something or sort of you know get it to pivot into something else or whatever it takes a long time that's our job we do it but if something has no future and everybody is agreeing with that much better put it to rest you know either return the cash or do whatever but just not spend any energy on those and just focus on the better companies, which will actually generate the returns. Because we know, unless you're exceptional, that less than 10, 15% of your portfolio will be the one that matters. Precisely. Sometimes you just got to move on and yeah. know when it's time to move on. Uh, today, we see so many more startups than when you started 10 years ago, mm -hmm. 10 plus years ago. Uh, how do you think about the number of companies there are and people's ability to get a series a because as a seed stage investor you're pro i mean i i i'll just ask you have you ever seen a positive outcome for you that didn't include a series a after you invested so currently no not really i mean I have an exception, but the exceptions don't really matter in this um, in this environment where you actually sell a couple of companies. Uh, you know, um, we had Niche that was acquired by Twitter when it was a seed stage company. We had uh, a couple mm. of you know early acquisitions that were you know pretty good. Chariot was acquired yeah. by um, uh, Ford before um, a Series A. Before a Series A, uh, but they don't. They're, they're sort of the exception. So yeah. the natural sort of path uh, to greatness is. Um, get your seed, prove uh, you know that you have early product market fit. Get a bit of, of revenue, figure out you know traction, bit of marketing. Go to raise a Series A, which will give you you know two years of runway. Try and get the the best possible sort of Series A investor. Because the th the way to think about your early rounds is really they enable your next round. So mm. 
the day you close, you start the race to the next round. Mm. So C enables Series A, Series A enables the Series B. And then that's when things start to uh, bifurcate a little bit. Mm. Um, some awesome companies will just go break even and mm. be profitable and won't need to raise ever. They may raise, but not for the reasons of I need to, you know, yeah. I need to raise cash to burn. I'm basically, you know, raising cash to grow faster. Um, others will still continue to um, uh, to raise cash because they need to, uh, you know, stay on the trade mill and, and grow their revenue and so on and so forth. Um, the It's very hard for a company to uh, sort of succeed and have this awesome growth curve just on seed or series A financing. Yeah. Most companies these days raise, you know, tens of millions of dollars. However, if you look at Fitbit, we're talking about Fitbit. Fitbit only consumed $32 million to actually go Amazing. to so um, efficient. IPO. They raised 60-ish, 66. But they but only used 32. They only used 32. So they had a massive cushion. So that means they were cash efficient. Oh, they were super capital. I mean, it turns they were frugal. out- they were They were capital efficient, but not at the beginning. Right. right. Uh, that's the issue. The startup costs of a hardware company are pretty atrocious. Yeah. So it's, it's really important for companies to figure out their Series A pitch. This is where you were going. And, yeah. you know, for, for the longest time, um, I've talked about the Series A crunch, which, you know, just intellectually, you say you 10x the throughput of the seed market, right? You have 570 mm. funds, you have a bunch of angels, angel list or whatever. So you have thousands and thousands of companies being seed funded. And they all get onto Sun Hill Road, or, you know, Second mm. Street in San Francisco, like trying to get uh, onto South Park to meet a bunch of, yeah. of firms. And the number of Series A firms has barely changed in the last 10 years, mm. right? You've lost some, you have some which have uh, come up to market, but roughly it's the same number of partners and same number of firms. So harder and harder to clear so market. So harder and harder. And, you know, I haven't really seen sort of that drop off because those Series A firms have, have actually sort of responded to the market by doing more deals. But I think that over the past two years, we've seen sort of a normalization of the market where things get compressed. We still, I mean, um, we still do extremely well. And and I think this year we've had, I don't know, 12, 15, whatever sort of series. A. We Essentially, we, only one company that we tried to raise a series A for didn't raise, right? Wow. So we have a really good track record because we know what it takes to raise a so you're thinking a. about that when you invest so in the seed. Yes. So it's, you know, founders, product, market opportunity, and series A fundability. Right. So if I don't have a good sense that something I know I can raise for this company from, you know, a set of five or 10 funds, mm. then I will likely not invest because- yeah. So this I'm, is what I've added to my game. I didn't think about that all that much. And that's a leak in my investment game where I was just like, I, VCs don't, I used to think, well, VCs don't get it now, but they'll get it later. And then I realized like, sometimes they're just not gonna get this one. Nope. And then this company is going to have a seriously hard time. But I also see it as sort of a, and maybe I'm crazy, but I kind of feel like this, the VCs have raised the bar so high mm -hmm. for a series A and they've said overpay in the series A. Mm -hmm. I'll overpay in the series A. I hear this over and over again. Come back to me when it's a sure bet yep. or a surer bet. And I say, wow, to myself, there must be this huge opportunity or arbitrage where they want more performance. We all invest in the companies and they just need another year and another million dollars or another year and another $2 million. Mm -hmm but they're willing to raise at the valuation that they did last year or slightly above it. So that to me seems like a, an opportunity that should be emerging. Do you see that opportunity in the space? So that, that's the bet that um, Paul Martino and his colleagues at Bullpen have, ah. you know, sort of singled out as what they wanted to go after, which is the, the post-seed, pre-A, seed prime, seed mm. twos uh, market. And, you know, they've they've done well in investing uh, in a number of companies. And when Paul, who have known forever, like literally uh, mm. even longer than I have known you, came to see me to um, pitch the concept. I said, but you're going to have adverse selection because mm. at the end of the day, the very best companies will go through, mm. you know, the series of hurdles and the ones that fail, like here's the hurdle, you fail, you fail, you fail. Well, 
Does how a million can dollar you get you over it or not? Yeah. Right? And I think a very, like if you're very, very good at spotting like the the twinners, like the the one that was almost sort of going to get there, you probably will. Or they're going to get there. They're they just need a little more time, right? Like the performance is there, but the bar has been raised so high that they just need a little bit more time. But you know, we're you know, we're portfolio. I think that every time we sort of go through a, a post seed or pre A round or whatever, it's sort of an indicator that it's going to be tricky. It's going to be tricky. Yeah, yeah. See, so the dynamic right now is one of the things about this. Uh, game that we play, this pursuit that we have of early stage investing, it's always changing. Yeah. So this Series A crunch did not exist. The seed uh, phase, as Satya from uh, Homebrew called it recently on an episode when I was talking to him, this seed is moving into a phase. Mm -hmm. It's almost like there's a venture phase and there's a seed phase, not mm -hmm. a seed investment, not a seed round, but a seed phase of four or five deals and then a venture phase of four or five deals. Do you, do you buy that? Do you find that? Credible? I, um, it's kind of an interesting way of, of thinking about it. But if you look at this uh, overall ecosystem that has been built from, from zero uh, mm -hmm. in the last 10 years, so you had the few super angels that were investing their own capital, and then we all raised funds in the 2007, 2010 uh, kind of vintage. And that was the, the first cohort of micro VCs and then more came and then more came. And so differentiation started to happen. And, you know, because we were successful and more people wanted to uh, give us capital, then we started raising larger funds. And because we raised larger funds, we wanted to, to write larger checks. And so the interesting question is, did those seed, you know, rounds become larger because we had larger funds or did we have to raise larger funds because the seed rounds became larger? Mm -hmm. But the point is, you certainly had people sort of wedging into the market and creating those pre-seed uh, rounds and pre-seed funds because I was no longer writing the first check. Right. I was writing the first large check. Right. When I got started in 2004, I was literally writing the 25K check that would help incorporate the company, get a tax ID number, open a bank <laughs> account and cash yeah. the check. Get a desk. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right? That's what we're literally doing. Literally, you turn the lights on. Exactly. And so that's, that's what I was doing. And and now we write the first large check that will help the entrepreneur get, you know, a round together. So uh, Uncork is writing on average a million dollar uh, check in a two to three million dollar round um, uh, software or three to four million dollar round uh, hardware or uh, Frontier Tech, which means that we we get to invest about nine to 12 months after we did mm. in the early days. And so that created an opportunity in the market where you have on one side, the accelerators, on the other, the pre-seed funds. And we have no problem investing behind, you know, Manu Kumar at K9, my former partner, Charles Hudson at Precursor, um, because they do an awesome job to help the entrepreneurs go from nothing to having the beginnings of the product, right? Mm. We're not taking that early risk. The problem is that from the entrepreneur standpoint, by the time you raise a Series A, you haven't raised, you know, one round, you've raised two rounds, so you have more dilution than yeah. you used to. And if that's what Satya refers to as the venture of uh, the, the seed phase, yeah, I can see that. You know, some entrepreneurs will figure out bootstrap whatever or just go straight to a seed round, but it's it's definitely much less often than it used to. I'm trying to figure out and I think that's an interesting way to look at it. I'm, I'm trying to figure out if we should be pricing the rounds earlier as opposed to convertible notes. So I've started to have board meetings earlier with companies, like start having board meetings when they hit 50K a month in revenue yep. mm -hmm. and, and start getting them on that cadence of, here's what board meetings are, here's what resolutions are, here's what your employee stock option plan is, here's what director's insurance is. Just sort of get that infrastructure set up a little bit better to make it Series A ready. I'm also wondering, like, maybe we're too reliant on these multiple convertible notes that nobody knows what they own in the company, and we have to wait for this conversion moment, which is inevitably going to crush the spirit of the founder when they see exactly the dilution that the they dilution actually, that they suffered. actually yeah. suffered because they don't know early on. We should start pricing these rounds earlier, shouldn't we? Oh, like, we do I mean, we, like, only... I want to say 15% of our rounds are safes or yeah. uh, convert notes. Everything we do is priced equity, mm. you know, with, we, you know, we'll take board seats if, if this is something that the entrepreneur wants us to. We'll go through the hygiene of mm. 
you know, having board meetings and making sure everyone understands, you know, what they do. Because, the, you know, the sad thing that happens or mm. doesn't happen when you do a convertible note or a, um, a safe is legal due diligence. Right. You actually never go and check that the 83B election has done has been done properly. You never check that all the IP assignments have been done properly, which means that it's the Series A, you know, cleanup. investor that does the cleanup. And that cleanup costs Crap Crazy. load of cash. Yeah, and now you drop about 50, 60, 70 grand. Or more. Or, you know, you remember, I mean, it has happened to all of us when you sort of figure out, ooh, the entrepreneur hasn't signed a um, 83 b election, which means that they're going to get taxed. So we basically wipe out their equity, give them options, have to give them loans or whatever. Yeah. Like how many times has it happened? Yeah. Too often. Why? Because there's not, unfortunately, entrepreneurs don't want to pay legal fees so they work with you know their buddies who doesn't know anything about their cousins, the law a friend or, who is an associate who gave them some paperwork don't from, get the proper yeah. the proper advice and unfortunately saving five grand in legal fees may cost you five hundred thousand yeah exactly or it could yeah cost you your company yeah, yeah if you if you screw it up enough yes uh, I mean I've seen people who vested the shares in the company to people who are no longer there like they vested the founder shares to. Oh, yeah. And you're like, who's this person on the cap table who earns 15, 20%? It's like, oh, uh, yeah, that guy worked for us for a year. I've like, had that one of our companies. Um, basically, we had two founders owning 45% of the company, no vesting. And it was like, this is crazy. You guys, and, and someone said, they give me all this BS about why it was okay or fine. And I said, look, if you want my investment, you will have to vest your, your shares and put in place, you know, option pools and everything. Otherwise, I'm gone. Yeah. And they said, okay, fine, whatever. Literally three months later, they disagree, and one of the founders goes. Right. Just think about the company having 45% of Could have dead equity. It. Oh, it would be dead. It would, yeah, it would be, dead, be dead, right? You're just like, okay, this is intractable. You can't get the person to give up 45%. It's too much to give up, and they can't get the other person to go to work because every dollar they make, they got to give 50 cents to the other guy mm -hmm. who's not there anymore. It's crazy. All right, listen, Jeff, uh, thanks for coming on the program, sharing so much of your knowledge, uh, continued success, and everybody knows he's Jeff, just Jeff, first name club. I'm Jason, he's Jeff on Twitter. Yes, on Twitter. If people listening to the show are going to get the sense <laughs> that everybody gets their first name on Twitter, just to correct anybody who signs up for Twitter today, there can only be one Jeff and Jason on Twitter. You, you, just, be had Jeff, to be you just had to be early. You have to be early. You could be Jeff 475AF, but... Don't try to leave off the left, oh, last uh, son, yeah. Yeah, or something, because the Russian bots have taken up all the other handles on Twitter. Sad that Twitter hasn't broken out, huh? It's a, what do you think? Why is it? Why is Twitter stalled? Is it just their natural audience, or just not I'd, bold choices? It's it's such a quagmire conundrum to me that they can't get that business to grow. I uh, love it. I'm addicted. I agree with you. I think it's. Uh, uh, the lack of leadership on the product side. I think my, you know, I I respect uh, both Ev and Jack, but I think they've they've just had a hold on the product vision for too long. Yeah, and therefore Stagnation. where the market has evolved, um, they just haven't been able to uh, get mm. Twitter to um, to react. They had a very specific vision of what Twitter should be, and the fact that you know it took what, 10 years to get 280 characters mm -hmm. and they still don't allow you to freaking edit a tweet. <laughs> and for the reason that, you know, in the early days, uh, you sent an SMS to yeah. to, um, to do a tweet that and was the you, reason. Know, you couldn't did it. Now, I think there's always sort of the, the, the notion of, well, if you send a tweet and, you know, you then did it and you have a bunch of people react, what, what does that mean? So, okay, fine, yeah. whatever. But I think it's, it's lack of product leadership. And then this notion of, okay, well, what are we? What do, because Twitter is so important, mm. right? But it's, it's weird that they haven't been able to build a business. I think they should have been a collection of brands because Twitter, I think, has a natural audience that loves it. But I thought they were doing so well with Vine Periscope, mm -hmm. and that they could have been a collection of apps. Of services you, and apps and yes. different experiences. Yeah. The, I mean, candidly, that's that's exactly what uh, Facebook is doing, right? Right. Between, you know, Messenger and Instagram. I would and, have taken the DM out of Twitter because DM is such a powerful concept and made an app called DM, just direct messages. Mm -hmm. A separate direct messages app would probably have more usage than Twitter itself because more people talk to each other one-to-one -one or in groups than they do on Twitter publicly. That is right? probably and you, true. And you could make an entire app 
where 100% the UI and UX and, and everything. I mean, yeah, and I think the product experience and, and a stronger identity. Yeah. Because, you know, unfortunately, as Jeff, I get all the tweets addressed to Jeff, session, Jeff Sessions, Jeff Bezos, because it's like, at Jeff Space, and then... Oh, underscore. I get all Jason Isbell. Yes. I get all of Jason Emraz, Emraz, whatever his name is, Jason Bateman, Jason Statham. This is this is sort of where the uh, the the, uh, it's like worse the first on, name the first name basis you know Twitter uh, accounts. So it's worse on Instagram. I I literally can't look at my. I had to turn notifications off on Instagram because it's all kids in Malaysia or Singapore or China or mm. South Dakota are like at Jason. Check this out, and I'm just like, it's a person on their skateboard in their backyard dunking a basketball. Who is this person? Well, because they don't know. Like for them, yes. they, they create this sort of friends group and they address each other as, you know, a Jason, a Jeff or whatever. What they don't understand is the broader identity yeah. and the fact that it's not that Jeff hmm. or that Jason, it's us. I get added to private chat groups on Instagram with like 15-year-old kids in okay. all kinds of different cities talking about all kinds of crazy stuff. And then sometimes I'm like, I really don't need to see this. I got to get out of here. Like kids smoking weed, doing all kinds of stuff that kids do. All right, listen. Uh, follow Jeff, go check out uncorkcapital.com. Just one of the great firms uh, in the history of uh, the modern history of Silicon Valley, I should say. Continued success. Congratulations on five funds. Thank and you. And we'll check in with you again when you hit seven. We'll do our, you know, every seven year check in here at This Week in Startups. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Angel Podcast. Uh, you were our last time I think on This Week's Startups. Hey, if you love the program, go ahead and rate uh and subscribe and write a review on itunes we're also on spotify thanks to my friends at spotify thanks daniel for setting us up uh so you can find angel uh the podcast on spotify as well and overcast uh we don't have any formal relationship with them but boy that's a great product so check out overcast you can find us in overcast uh tune in and soundcloud and youtube okay we'll see you all next time bye bye